Good morning and good afternoon to some. Welcome to our second uh, National Geographic Explorer Classroom of the Day. Um, we are very excited uh, for today's opportunity connecting live in South Africa. Um, my name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host for today. I'm a grade seven and eight math and science teacher, um, as well as a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. So today we are joining paleoanthropologist and National Geographic Explorer in residence, Lee Berger, and his team live from the rising car, or star cave system. I did that this morning too, in uh, South Africa. In 2013, during the first expedition at Rising Star, Lee and his team discovered more than a thousand fossil elements belonging to Homo naledi, a previously unknown early human relative. Since then, they have discovered more chambers with more fossils and this, of this new species, including a nearly complete skeleton. Over the next three weeks, uh, the team will be excavating new fossil elements uh, they're on day three right now, and we're very excited to be joining the team live underground and above ground uh, in South Africa. So, Lee and team, how are things going? Well, it's going fantastic, Joe, and hello to all the classrooms. Um, we're very excited to have you here. This is a real experiment because you are some of the first uh, people to join us here underground live as we continue the exploration of the rising star cave system. Now where I'm sitting with Celindo, who's right behind me, and John. Celindo is a geologist. John is one of the other team leaders of our huge uh, uh, scientific uh, and exploration team that's involved in this project. We're actually sitting underground in what we call the command center. And I'll give you a tour of that in just a moment. But to tell you a little bit about where we are, here we are just outside of Johannesburg, South Africa. It's actually evening for us. The sun is going to be setting in the next 30 minutes or so, and it's beginning to cool down. It's winter where we are, so it's quite quite cool, and the antelope are beginning to come out onto the reserve around us. We're sitting about eight meters underground. You can see the rock walls behind me. And off to my left and in front of me are, is the Rising Star Cave System, where we conduct excavations as deep as um, 40 meters underground. So that's something like 150 feet underground. Now, those excavations are actually uh, quite a distance from us chamber where we discovered the richest site to ever contain uh, ancient human relatives on the continent of Africa it is about 350 feet from us in this direction and the Lacetti chamber is about 250 feet from us in this direction almost directly in front of me. Um, I can actually give you a look into those chambers because we've actually geared it up and as I move around I'm first going to show you a bit of the command center this is where we run the expedition uh, from underground. And here you can actually look into the chambers underground. What I'm showing you right now is the Lissetti chamber. And here's another image. That ladder goes up to the area that we're actually excavating. And this is the Dinaletti chamber. So imagine that those are some distance from us. And that's where we conduct the excavations for these very, very important and very rare fossils. The fossils of Homo naledi, which come from these, are a new species, and they were an unknown species until we actually began these excavations. They have tiny little brains about the size of an orange. They have ape-like shoulders, but they walk on two legs, and that's why we call them hominins or hominids. They're relatives of ours, but we don't know what kind of relatives they are. Are they uh, distant ancestors of ours? Or are they distant cousins of ours and we're still trying to understand that as we explore the mysteries of this chamber. The excavations will be going on for the next two and a half weeks and what we do here is very dangerous. So the people that do this are explorers and scientists and I'm going to introduce those in just a minute. If we could bring the other camera up, they're sitting with Africa in the background. Um, you can see uh, Ellen, Becca, and Marina. Now, Ellen, Becca, and Marina were some of the original, what we called underground astronauts. They were the very first scientists to ever enter that chamber, and they were responsible for recovering that material. And they've come back to join us. Well, Marina actually moved out here to live here and be one of the lead exploration scientists, and they've come back to help us with this very special, very important excavations as we look for more evidence of Homiletti. And then on the far right-hand side of the screen, very lonely there, is Eric. Eric is a geologist, 
and is, is actually one of the few geologists in the world that chamber. And we'll come join them in just a minute to talk about what each of them uh, does. But before I do that, um, I want to talk about what we do at the command center. This is where we run the excavation from. We have communications not only with each of those chambers on Wi-Fi, through security cameras, through telephones and intercom systems like this. We also communicate with the whole world. You can um, uh, follow this. I believe your hashtag is Explorer Classroom. Is that right, Joe? And you can actually follow all of us as scientists. Most of us are on Twitter and Facebook as we do these excavations live. Um, here is where we monitor the safety of the caves. We handle emergencies. We handle all scientific questions and help conduct the excavation. But the real work is done in those chambers. Now, if you can imagine this, to get into the Dinaletti chamber that I was showing you just a moment ago, you have to go through a 17 and a half inch squeeze. Now, that is a squeeze about the size of a dollar bill, about seven and a half inches if you're not using metric. And all of these explorers you're about to meet have been in that chamber multiple times, going down a 12 meter or near over 40 foot uh, squeeze that's that narrow. So you can imagine how dangerous that is and how difficult it would be to get out. Celindo is a geologist and he's gonna tell you a little bit about what he does here working with our teams. Oh, hey everyone. Um, so I'm Celindo, as Lee said. Um, so I'm a geologist, what I'm interested in basically is once they've found all these fossils, uh, they come with a lot of these sediments and these rocks, and I try and understand where they're coming from. So in order for me to, in order for us to recreate anything, we need to know where it's coming from, and this really helps us just tie in the story of how these animal, how these um, ancestors were were dealing with the environment and how they actually got into the caves. And also, what's really cool about what geologists do is that we also dating it, so saying how old they were and when they were buried and how they were buried. So that's what I'm interested in. And John Hawks here, um, he's also a scientist. He's one of the team leaders. And he uh, has helped us not only with the science of this, but also in communicating the science. John? Yeah, what we try to do once the bones are out of the cave is figure out what kind of animal Homo naledi was. How is it related to us? How does its bones tell us about its lifestyle and, and what it might have been like? Uh, so once the bones come out of the cave, then we have a lot of work to do in the lab. And that laboratory work involves another team of, of more than 100 scientists around the world. Just going to give you a little quick look around the command center, too. Off in the distance, you can see the amazing cave that we're down in. There's the evening light coming in. And somewhere around me is my fossil dog, Tao. He always comes along on these expeditions with us. He's actually underneath the table uh, with us right now. Let's go over now to uh, the explorer scientists. Um, and let me uh, have each one of them introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about uh, what they do. But particularly, I want some of the uh, underground astronauts to tell us a little bit about their experiences in the cave, who they are, and, and what they're doing. Can we start with Ellen there on the left? And Ellen, tell us a little bit about your role in the expedition and, and, and what you do uh, as a scientist and related to the study of Homo naledi and Rising Star. Um, hi, my name is Ellen, as Lisa said. Um, I am one of the excavators for Rising Star. So Marina only bring me in when they need to or want to do some excavation. Um, I personally am a um, ecologist. So I specialize in something called evolutionary biomechanics. So what I'm really interested in is the form and function of the, the skeletons, the bodies of our um, fossil ancestors and how they moved about the landscape. So I specialize um, further in the upper limb, so that is the hand, the elbow, and the shoulder. And I'm really interested in seeing how the, the shape um, of the shoulder in particular sort of relates to how fossil hominins were moving around their environments. So Marina, who's up next, she's one of our lead explorers. She runs our exploration teams. Uh, she comes from Canada, and I saw there were a couple of Canadian classrooms on there. Marina, could you tell us a little bit about the process of, of working underground and how we excavate and then how we bring fossils out? Sure. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Marina. 
as Lee said, um, I'm a, I was one of the original underground astronauts. I have since moved to South Africa where I lead the exploration team and spend quite a lot of my time underground. Um, and so this expedition uh, is sort of an expansion of what we do on a normal basis. Probably the, the basic sort of route for the fossils that when we go down underground, and that's not a very easy process, but once we get underground and we start excavating, you know, it's a, a very slow, very methodical system that we use. Uh, the material that we're getting out is not in, in hard rock, like you may have seen with some other fossils, but in soft dirt. So the tools that we use are things like a tiny toothpick or sometimes just a bamboo skewer and a little tiny paintbrush to scoop up the sediments. And as we do that, we're trying to expose the fossils once we've actually got them cleared away and we've documented them with pictures and drawings and that kind of thing, um, we actually collect them in small plastic containers, often just Tupperware, wrapped in bubble wrap, and then uh, we very carefully bring them to the surface, sometimes for very delicate pieces that involves actually passing the fossils from hand to hand, caver to caver, all the way through the cave system. In fact, the picture that Lee is showing you there actually shows one of our, our excavation tools, which in fact is a toy uh, uh, dustpan and dust broom, which I found in a, in a children's store, but it's the perfect size for us because we haven't got a lot of space. Thank you, Marina. And I am, I'm just showing some of the flags that are down in the chamber that are used to very precisely map uh, all of these fossils. And maybe Becca, you could talk about um, how important it is to keep track of where these fossils come from. And then also about the journey once you've done the fossils that they take going out. And if you're watching carefully, kids, you can see uh, a bat fly through every now and then on the upper right. <laughs> You'll see, I'll show you a bat in just a little bit that comes by every now and then. Uh, when we're excavating these fossils, as soon as we dig them up, there's no way that we can ever put them back in exactly the same way they were with exactly the same dirt around them. Uh, so once we once we remove the fossils, they're, they're out and we've, we need to make sure that we keep very careful track of exactly where they came from, both horizontally and vertically, how deep they were um, in the soil or, or compared to things around them. So we have um, put a grid sort of uh, with flags we've measured out uh, like graph paper onto the floor of the cave. And each of those flags has a number on it, a very specific number that tells us um, where it is. And we can recreate that on the surface on a piece of paper. So all of the fossils and all of the sediment that we bring out of the cave very, very carefully with the, its grid square so that we can then know where it came from after it's not in the cave anymore. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of keeping track of convenience or where things came from. Once we have excavated something and very carefully noted it and made a bunch of photographs um, and double checked that we've got the right label on it for the right convenience square, then we bundle it up, like Marina said, in plastic bags and bubble wrap in a Tupperware container. And if we're working in the Dinaletti chamber, then that fossil has to come up through the chute. So it gets, it gets placed in a dry bag, clipped onto a carabiner on a rope that someone climbs up the chute so it's only 18 centimeters wide at its narrowest point. And that's a bit of a mission to climb up through there. The person gets to the top, and then with the rope, they carefully try to pull the bag up behind them. But boy, that chute is not smooth. It's not like going down a slide or in a tube. It's very jaggedy on the inside. So the bag always gets hung up on something. So someone else climbs up behind the bag and sort of knocks it off so it can have a clear path around the rocks going up. And then when the bag is at the top of the chute, um, uh, a caver or, or a scientist will take the bag and scramble out a, a little tube shaped space that you can kind of squat down in and crab walk through um, to the top of the dragon's back and you have to step up across a big gap to get onto the dragon's back but we're clipped into a rope there so that's nice it's a, it'd be a bad fall if we didn't quite make a step across the gap and then we climb down the dragon's back with the bag Sometimes we clip the bag to our harness. Sometimes we pass it off to someone else. Um, the dragon's back is, uh, it's, it's rock climbing, for real, just like you would think of if you went to a climbing gym, only it's underground and it's dark in there. Uh, we get to the bottom of the dragon's back and we go through a thing called the Superman crawl. And the Superman crawl is yet another tube. There's lots of tubes, but these are not smooth ones. Uh, this one you sort of do an army crawl through and 
And I'm told that it's called the Superman's crawl because folks with broader shoulders than I have have to put one arm in front of their head, uh, sort of like they're flying like Superman in order to fit through. Um, I don't know what the big deal is. <laughs> <laughs> he walks upright through it. No, that's kidding. <laughs> uh, once you're on the other side of the Superman crawl, you drag your bag through. Grab onto the bag, and then it's just a series of hallways. Some of them you have to walk, you can walk straight and upright. Some of them you're stepping over boulders or walking sideways because you're, you can't fit through, even I can't fit through straight away. So you're sort of shimmying through sideways, and then pretty soon you emerge right behind Celinda there, um, right behind where Lee and John and, and Slinder are, uh, right out there, and you've brought your fossil to the surface. And then it goes um, eventually in a truck. Uh, back to the university lab uh, in Johannesburg, where it gets analyzed. And, and so uh, just to tell you, um, where Celindo and John and I are right now is right over Ellen's right shoulder. We're actually underneath that hill uh, in the background behind you. We're in the rocks underneath that hill. They're on the Rising Star Nature Reserve, and they're actually some antelopes, which are in the distance uh, uh, right behind them um, that are, are wandering around there. Now, Eric is a geologist, and Eric looks at the uh, both the formation of the whole system that these caves are in, but also the chambers themselves. There's something really special about these chambers. We actually believe that Homo Naledi was deliberately putting uh, they're dead in these chambers, which is very special because until we made this discovery, we thought only modern humans did that. Um, could you tell us, Eric, a little bit about the geology of the area, just briefly, that, that forms all of this, the ancient Dolomites, and how the caves form themselves behind you? Yeah. So the landscape that we're working on and the caves are formed in is quite an old landscape, um, and it's formed in... Uh, dolostone or limestone that's several billion years old. And so the caves have started forming maybe in the last four or five million years and rising star maybe less than that. And as the caves form, as that limestone or dolostone dissolves, it leaves behind sediment, residue uh, that's insoluble. And that material makes its way into the cave and forms a lot of the sediment that covers the fossils. Not only that, we have sediment that's coming in from outside. And so one of the things that we're trying to understand with these fossils uh, is, is the hypothesis that Lee has put forward and other uh, members of the team, that the fossils in the 101, the dental lady chamber, uh, were put there deliberately. And some of the other hypotheses or, or possibilities is that they could have been washed in by flood or brought in by predators or, or a number of other these. And one of the ways that we check to figure out whether these hypotheses are plausible or not is by looking at the sediments that contain the fossils. And in a sort of nutshell, one of the things that we've seen is that the sediment in the dinolady chamber is very distinct from that in the other chamber systems. Uh, the other chambers have a mixture of sediment that's brought in from the outside as well as sediment that forms from the, the dis, uh, dissolution of the limestone. But when we get into the 101 chamber, it's quite unique. The only sediment that we can find in there is very fine grained sediment that's basically um, developed by the dissolving of the limestone. We don't see any of that other sediment that comes in from outside. So it really supports the hypothesis um, that the paleoanthropologists have put forward of a chamber that has um, a variety of different uh, skeletons that have probably been either placed in there uh, or brought in rather than a flood or uh, animals bringing them in and, and some of the uh, other sort of ideas out there or other animals may have brought them in but we don't see any other fauna uh, any other animals other than the hominins. So as you can see from all of these uh, scientists, explorers, it takes a really multidisciplinary team, people with lots of different skills to do this. In fact, there's well over a hundred scientists from all over the world that are brought in to work on these problems, the fossils, the caves, and we have ex specialized exploration teams that, that go out and make these discoveries and actually do the dangerous excavation underground. So Joe, I think we've introduced ourselves. Uh, maybe we uh, might have some time to take some questions 
from some of these. It's just to tell the kids, it's a rare opportunity to have extraordinary explorers who actually risk their lives every day going underground in your presence. And a great time to ask them a question about kind of what it's like to be that. Absolutely. And Lee, again, thank you so much and team for spending the time to share a little bit of your exploration and your world for the next three weeks. Um, we do have six classrooms joining us from different spots around North America in Canada and the United States. Um, we also have viewers watching online. So anybody who is watching, if you're a classroom, uh, please share a picture with us. Use the hashtag Explorer Classroom and uh, also use the YouTube chat sidebar to fire off a question to us. And um, yeah, let us let us know where you're from. We're curious who is watching and, and joining in. Um, we're going to introduce the classrooms. A couple of the classrooms will need to just give me a little introduction. Uh, Google Drive is not cooperating today, so we can't get into our spreadsheet. But let's start off uh, at the Huckaday School in Dallas, Texas. We have a large group hanging out there with us. Some grade 11 and 12s, also some, some grade 4s, 5s, and grade 7s. So let me turn your microphone on, and you can go ahead with a question or two, and then we'll meet our next class. Everybody say hi. 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 Um, given the location of the site and the fact that the presence of the skeleton seems intentional, what does this discovery change about how we think about ourselves? Uh, what a fantastic question. Firstly, I just want to say that all of those underground astronauts you see and myself will be in Dallas at Hockaday School in just a, over a month and we're really excited to, to join you guys there. Um, but I'm gonna let I'm gonna let John talk to that uh, talk a little bit about what that meaning is but I will say that one of the things is that intentional disposal has been one of the things that we use to humanity, what it means to be human. And with that introduction, I'm going to let John go. You know, the, the really important thing about humans is how much we care about each other and cooperate with each other. And working together allows us to do things that other kinds of animals don't do. When we look at other animals, many of them do look live in social groups. Like chimpanzees, who are very close relatives of ours, live in social groups they live for a long time and they care about each other. They know each other very well. They don't have any deliberate thing that they do when another individual dies. And for a long time, people have assumed that it's because humans are cultural and very, very smart and we're cooperating in different ways. It may be that Homo naledi, which had a very small brain, much, much smaller than ours, was still able to care about each other and think about what it meant when someone died and do something special then. Every human group everywhere in the world has some special thing that, that people do when someone that they know dies. And if that's something that occurred in a very primitive species like Homo naledi, it tells us that it's something that's very deep within us and not something that necessarily took so much of a big brain and so much smarts. Right, so it's really important. And by the way, um, if any of you have ever heard like elephants, graveyards, and things like that, those don't actually really exist. That's all a myth. So if Homo naledi is del intentionally disposing of its dead air, it would be the first species that's not human or very much like a human with our cranial capacity that we've ever met, that even though the species is dead, it's, it's still the first one that we've ever met that has that complex behavior. And that's really cool. All right, great question. Let's grab another one from our class uh, at the Hockaday School. Excellent question. Um, okay. Well, will the genetic information you find from the skeletons help you date the species since the cave has protected it so well, making dating it difficult? So um, th there's almost two things in that. One is I really hope you're right that we get genetic material from this. It would be really important. We're trying with some of the very best labs in the world that get ancient DNA out of bones. So far, we've not been successful, but I promise you this, we're going to keep trying. 
if we got ancient DNA out of these bones, it would be incredibly important because it would be, firstly, some of the most ancient DNA from a human relative ever recovered, and it would talk to us about the link, uh, what is the link between Homo naledi and us, and it would tell us a lot about the deep ancestry of our genus. So we are really hoping that what you're predicting will come true and we will get DNA. The second thing is, it's nice that you brought up the age of Homo naledi. It was very, very hard to actually date Homo naledi, and we did that with a variety of techniques, six different ones, 11 different labs, and we announced just a few months ago that uh, the chamber is between 250 and 350,000 years, which is surprisingly young because everyone thought Homo naledi was going to be millions of years old because how it looked, and that too is very exciting. Great question. All right. Thank you, Dallas, Texas. Let's visit a Canadian classroom. Uh, Mrs. Rasiga's grades four to six are joining us from Smooth Rock Falls in Ontario. And let me turn your microphone on and go ahead. Hi. Hi. Hello. Okay, we have our first question here. Once these fossils are excavated, who do they belong to and will they be in a museum? All right, great question, and I can answer that one. They belong in South Africa to the people of South Africa. They also belong to the people of the world, because where we are in this wonderful cave is actually part of a big world heritage site of about 50,000 hectares. And will they ever be a museum? In fact, they're at our university, and they're in a museum right now, just down the road from us at a visitor center to the World Heritage Site. A portion of the assemblage is on display to the public for at least a few more months. And it's a great chance if you fly to South Africa, you can see the real thing at a place called Maripang. And I invite you all to see it. All right, another great question. And go ahead if you have one more. difficult is it to get approval to excavate in a cave in another country? Okay, so I'm going to have to answer that one again. It, it's actually uh, difficult and easy at the same time. So I'm with a university here in South Africa, so it's not another country for me. I'm also a South African citizen like Salindo is. And because we're associated with universities here in South Africa, we apply for a permit from the government. They look at the research questions we ask, and hopefully within a couple of months, we get an answer back that our scientific progress has uh, been approved. If you're, a, if you're a foreign team, that is a team that lives in another country, um, in South Africa, you have to apply with a South African university so there, or a museum, so there's always a collaboration. All right, thank you, Smooth Rock Falls. We're gonna jump to another Canadian classroom. Mr. Wright's grade six sevens are in Sarnia, Ontario at St. Matthew's. Um, if you have some questions, we're ready. Perfect, uh, we did have one question. Uh, one of the students was asking, um, were you able to name this discovery when you found it? <laughs> Well, I'll let John tell you a little story, but um, yes, our team got to name this discovery. We got to name the chamber, um, uh, both the chambers, the Dinaledi Chamber, uh, in uh, our African language here, uh, means Chamber of Stars. And we named it that because it came from the Rising Star uh, system. The Lissetti Chamber means Chamber of Light. Um, and we named Homo Naledi. Naledi means star in the sky. So we got to put it in our genus and and, um, uh, and and name it star. John, you have anything else to say about that? Well, I would say in terms of naming species, it's something where you, when we come up with a name and, and we still have to demonstrate to other scientists that it's real. And that means that when we publish our description of it and publish the science that we've done, other scientists have read that and they agree that this is something that's really new. And so naming the species is actually part of that scientific process. All right, very cool. I'm gonna need a little bit of help from the next classrooms just because Google Drive wasn't cooperating, but we'll start with 
Let me turn the microphone on. Mrs. Jeanette's group in Saskatchewan. Can you tell me where you are in Saskatchewan? I am a fellow uh, from Saskatchewan. I was born in Mooseman. So where are you guys and what grade are you? We are in Regina and we are grade five. Excellent. Well, if you have a question or two, Lee and the team are ready. How long have you guys been scientists? <laughs> oh, wow. I'm going to let everyone uh, answer that individually. I myself have been a scientist uh, living in Africa and working in Africa for 28 years. You, uh, I'm probably the youngest one here. <laughs> um, I would say about, it's about five, six years now, six years. I'm 23 years a scientist. How about the underground astronauts and Eric? Uh, about 11 years. Yep. Um, well, yeah, I guess I would have to say it's probably 10 years or so. I actually only got my PhD a couple of years ago, but, um, oh, and I think actually everybody's a scientist in a certain way, because if you're curious and you ask good questions and you try to find the answer using a, a method and a testing system, then I think just about everybody is a scientist. Uh, good answer. <laughs> Becca. Marina took my answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got my PhD just this last year, uh, finished my PhD, but um, I have been curious about how things work in the world for as long as I can remember. And, and you know, when you uh, are on the playground on the slide and you wonder what will make you go faster and you try something, then that makes you a scientist. You're experimenting and you're seeing how things how, how things work and, and trying to understand. And Eric. Yeah, uh, I, I suppose I've been a scientist for about 20 years now. And uh, almost every one of those years, uh, likely uh, working in different parts of Africa and exploring and. I think exploration is also another really uh, exciting part of doing science. I think the message there in all the classrooms is that uh, everyone's an explorer scientist. If you have this, this exploration gene in your nature, and all of you can be and should be. All right. I think that's a great point. I love that. As a teacher myself, I like what you're saying over there. Um, one more time check, Regina. Do you guys have one more question? Yeah, we have one more. Okay. Um, do you guys ever get scared in the caves, or do you ever find a fossil that startles you a little bit? Oh, I'm gonna let the three underground astronauts take that. Fire away. How about how about Becca? You start with that. Do you ever get scared in the cave? Uh, safety is so important to us that we check and double check everything when we're on the surface before we even go underground. And then while we're underground, we move slowly and deliberately, and we have a buddy system and safety checks all the way along. And we work with folks like Eric to help us make sure that the cave itself is stable enough for us to be in there, that it's not going to um, have any damage in the cave that could cause us problems. Um, so when I'm in the cave, I don't say that I'm scared, but I say that I'm aware of what my surroundings about, you know, where my head is so I don't bump it on something. And, you know, whether the rock that I'm touching is loose or not. And um, I, I try to be very conscious of, of where I am and where my body is and where my where my friends and my colleagues are as well to, to help keep us all, all safe. Besides the bats that keep flying behind your head, which uh, probably the audience can see and you can't, Marina, you ever been startled by a fossil? Well, yeah, I was going to answer the second part of that question. And I think probably the, sorry for the trucks going by on the road there, um, the fossil that startles me the most Gosh, we'll wait for the noise to die down. Um, was actually the, the fossil that Becca and I uncovered in 2014. And that was the articulated hand that many of you have seen. And one of the most exciting parts about that was that as we uncovered it, we could tell that the hand was in position like it had just basically all the tissue or all the skin had just come off. And its little fingers were curved over the palm like this. And for me, I think that, that was one of the most exciting moments of the expedition. How about you, Ellen? Do you ever get frightened when you're squeezing through those narrow, narrow cavities? I'm not frightened, no. I'm much like Becker, I'm just very keenly aware of my surroundings at any given point in time because this is a, a 
fairly geologically stable system, but you still need to be aware because stuff does change and it can change overnight, right? Uh, a, a rock might be knocked loose that you weren't anticipating or whatever. So you just have to sort of keep on your toes at any given point in time. Sometimes I feel uncertain. Uh, for instance, yes. I went into uh, the Dinaletti chamber for the first time in four years and going down that chute had me very keenly aware that, you know, I was not as familiar with the system as I used to be, right? So I was double checking everywhere I was going with my feet and my hands. I was ripped on tight to my, my safety line so I wouldn't fall off it just in case. And I, I made sure that I had a caber above me and someone below me who was aware of what I was doing in the shoot at any given point in time. So yeah, it's just a matter of being aware. Let me assure, let me assure all the classrooms that these are very, very special people. What they do is, is very dangerous. They're squeezing through the narrowest things and, 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 and they have very special personalities to be able to go into these deep, <laughs> dark, dangerous places and, and do this work. All right, thank you. We're gonna to jump to our last group, Mrs. Cord's group. Can you let me know, let me turn your mic on. What grade you are and where are you from? Oh, your mic came off again, let me turn it on again. There we go. Hi, how you doing? Good, where, who, where are yeah. you guys from and what grade are you? We are a seventh grade science and engineering class in Pico Rivera, California at Rivera Middle School. Awesome. Well, we're excited for your question or two. So we are like, we're in California, like way just a little suburb outside Los Angeles. Okay, so this is Caleb. Caleb has a question. So I, I heard you've, you have discovered the Homo naledi skeleton. Is there any other discoveries you have made in the Rising Star Cave system? Oh, good question. You're probably being put up to that by some other scientists who want to know all the insider information. Um, we have made other discoveries in here. Um, probably next year we're going to begin uh, excavating an area where we think there might be artifacts and where we think Homo naledi might have been living outside of uh, the systems that we're in now. And also, throughout this cave system, there are areas that have the most wonderful, wonderful fossils in them. There's even one area that has a huge, a really giant saber-toothed cat skeleton stuck up onto the ceiling that uh, someday we're gonna take out, as well as lots of other neat fossils. This system is full of wonderful fossils and we'll have years and years and years, maybe some of you, you become paleoanthropologists or paleontologists or explorers will find yourself working in this cave system on many of the beautiful fossils. All right, and if you have one more question, go ahead. I'll just turn your mic back on for you. Okay. Okay, Fabian. Uh, how long does it take to get into the the cave? I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that to Marina. Okay. Well, I'll maybe take uh, the Dinaletti chamber, and then one of the other women can take the Lissetti chamber. So, from the entrance um, on the surface to the Dinaletti chamber, on a good day without any equipment, probably takes about half an hour, forty minutes. Um, but if you've got fossils or you've got equipment to carry, it can take quite a bit longer. So, and as Lee said, I think a little bit earlier, that's only about 200 meters away. So you can imagine how slow you have to go. Okay. Or, uh, for the Lissetti chamber, um, I would say on average, like if you've got no equipment, you're not carrying too many bags or too much sediment or heavy material, it can take about 25, 30 minutes, maybe max. Um, sometimes even 20 minutes, depending on how how quickly you're managing it. Some Sometimes it gets quite slippery and you have to slow down, but otherwise, the Lissetti chamber is a little bit easier to reach than, than the Dinaletti chamber, for sure. So a, a great exercise to do, if you want to know how difficult it is and how they are understating how difficult it is, go out onto a football field or a soccer field. That's about the, the that's about halfway the distance they actually have to travel um, to it and, and try to walk across it taking say 25 minutes to just walk from one end to the of the football field of, to the other and you'll see how slowly they're having to move to actually get into these chambers you'll get an idea of just how difficult it is back to you joe 
All right. Well, thank you very much for another great set of questions. Um, if you do want to check out uh, the route and just how tough it is, there actually you can find some video online. Um, I believe some of Marina's and Lee's Nat Geo Talks have a little bit of video that shows the squeezes and the tightness and just how difficult it is to get down there. There is a, there's a great video on YouTube called Going Through the Post Box that shows extremely well some of those squeezes and how hard it is to squeeze through. And then there's a documentary called Dawn of Humanity by PBS Nova that you can also watch on YouTube. Excellent. Well, Lee, John, Celindo, Marina, Ellen, Becca, and Eric, thank you so much for another amazing hangout from the Rising Star uh, Cave System. It's very early expedition, so I know there's lots of good things to come. Uh, for those who don't know, we'll be connecting again on September uh, 14th, uh, same time, 11 a.m. Eastern, and we'll also be connecting uh, on the 21st uh, at the same time. So we'll get to see a little bit of what's happening uh, over the course of the expedition. As always, you can check out uh, National Geographic Education for all kinds of great resources and other things that you can use uh, in your classrooms related to this, as well as many other uh, activities that explorers are undertaking. Um, if you did take any pictures, please use the hashtag uh, Explorer Classroom. We'd love to see them. I'm sure Lee and his team would love to see them as well. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to turn the mics on so the classrooms can say goodbye and thank you. But uh, thank you, North America. Thank you, uh, Canada and the US for the great questions. And once again, Lee, thank you to your team. Thank you, everyone. It was great talking to you. Great questions. All right, microphone's coming on for a goodbye and thank you from our classrooms, and we will sign off for today. Bye. All right, thank you everybody for joining us today. Explore Classroom is signing off.